it stands. Charles, I promised Mrs. Green, the president of our club, that you'd talk to the ladies, and she wants to know what you're going to talk about. Well, what am I going to talk about? Lectures usually give them uh, travel or current events, don't they? Oh, Charles, not current events. We get current events. What sort of an audience would it be? Oh, women like myself, busy with our homes, most of us. Women keep busy in towns like this. The cities, it's different. The cities are full of women, middle-aged widows, husbands dead, husbands who've spent their lives making fortunes, working and working. And then they die and leave their money to their wives, their silly wives. And what do the wives do, these useless women? You see them in the hotels, the best hotels every day by the thousands, drinking the money, eating the money, losing the money at bridge, playing all day and all night, smelling of money. Proud of their jewelry, but of nothing else. Horrible. Faded, fat, greedy women. But they're alive. They're human beings. Are they? Are they, Charlie? Are they human or are they fat, wheezing animals? Hmm? What happens to animals when they get too fat and too old? Well, I seem to be making my speech right here. Well, for heaven's sake, don't talk about women like that in front of my dog. Welcome to Beyond the Bay, everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, Beyond the Bay, we're live. We are here tonight, and we're uh, sponsored by the, by the Bay Theater in Sutton's Bay, Michigan. We're a nonprofit organization running the Bay Theater. And we're here doing this tonight for you to enjoy and have a Q&A session, live Q&A session about the movie Beyond, uh, Beyond a Shadow of a Doubt. Yeah, I said Beyond the Bay. No, the, the movie Shadow of a Doubt. And tonight we have with us two guests to join us in speaking about this and discussing this. Uh, the first is Kevin Maher. Kevin is an industry uh, uh, professional. Kevin is an industry professional. Uh, that has worked for over 20 years at several studios, including Warner Brothers, 20th Century Fox, and Disney. Uh, Kevin is a member of our programming team at the Bay Community Theater and writes and maintains the film blog, top10filmlist.com. Joining uh, Kevin today is, also, is going to be Ted Kroll. Ted Kroll is a film historian who taught film classes at Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut, and helped establish a movie theater that is still operating today. Currently, Ted is a Leonel County resident and a member of the programming team at the Bay Community Theater. So thank you, gentlemen, for joining us tonight, and we look forward to our great discussion. So uh, tonight's Q&A is all about a uh, shadow of a doubt and how this is work. It works, will work, is as we are discussing, you're going to see that there's a chat area on your, either the right of your screen or it's on the bottom of your screen, okay? And that chat session will, in that chat session, you can, you can see people already out there and hello everybody. Hello, Sherry, Sheila, uh, and Rita so far. And hope everything's well with you. And we are, uh, you can chat with each other and you can also post questions and comments as you go along. And we have uh, somebody in the background uh, being White Fang for us tonight. And White Fang will take some of those questions, as many as we can from the audience, and get through them through the, way, the night and have our panelists answer those questions. All right, so but to get started, as we're still just getting to getting here and let people join us, uh, let's just go ask a first question of the uh, uh, panelists about why this movie is significant to remain in film history. And let's start with Ted tonight to talk about that. Hello, everybody. Um, I was thinking about this and I think part of what what's happened in this film it really wasn't well known for a long time, and and I think part of the reason was um, Alfred Hitchcock in in the forties and fifties and and most of the sixties was seen as an entertainer, and he was seen as the master of suspense, and you know he he had those droll comments that uh, Alfred Hitchcock presents, and so people really never took him seriously as an artist, so in France. Um, there were some critics that uh, made a big, the Cahiers du Cinema made a big deal about um, Hitchcock and did an analysis on his work, saw him as a, a moral, um, telling moral tales and that kind of thing. And um, over the years, that, that caused a reevaluation of all his work. And um, people knew his, his really flashy ones like 
um, Psycho and North by Northwest, um, Rear Window. Um, but in this reevaluation, they would go back to some of the lesser known ones. And one of those was Shadow of a Doubt. And part of what made that stand out was Hitchcock uh, in several interviews said that was his favorite film. So people went back and reevaluated and saw what a, a marvelous little film it is. Um, the, the, the performances are excellent. The, the, uh, um, but just the, the whole situation of, of uh, having a normal family. I mean, they keep saying over and over they're the average family and then have this evil uncle um, who seems on, on surface seems to be, um, you know, the, just the quite sophisticated you know, gay blade. Um, but he's a, and um, he, he completely disrupts, um, well, his niece. We'll get into that. So it, it's, it's one of these great little Hitchcock films uh, where he put a lot into it. And um, it, it, it has gained its reputation over the years as Hitchcock is being reevaluated as being the great film artist that he is. So that's what I'd say. <laughs> okay, good. Well, thank you. How about next, uh, Kevin? What do you think about being how this remains in film history? Well, <clears throat> for me, the reason why it's so important is because it's actually, uh, in my opinion, uh, Hitchcock's first American made masterwork. Um, before he came to America in 1940, he had he was the preeminent director in England and was incredibly well known, um, developed his his reputation as the master of suspense and had been making movies since 1922. So when he came to America in, in 1940 um, to work um, for producer David O. Selznick, um, he made Rebecca, which was his first film from an, an American studio, which won uh, the best um, Oscar for best picture, which went to David O. Selznick. He made a, a several other films, um, Suspicion, Foreign Correspondent, et cetera, but they were always set in England or in some European type locale, but primarily England. Shadow of a Doubt is his first American movie set in America. Um, and, and combining the fact that it's his first masterwork um, since he came to America and that it's his first truly American set movie, um, I think is reason alone to, to grant it um, you know, its place in, in history. Um, Ted's points are, are very well taken about the sort of the reevaluation of Hitchcock's career um, in the late 50s. That was also at the arguably uh, the the height of his professional career with his run of um, North by Northwest, Psycho, Rear Window, and Vertigo, um, all you know, one right after the other. Um, so I think that you know people elevated his genius. Um, at a much greater level. And there was this look back towards some of his earlier work. Um, I think we'll, we'll, we can talk about it later, but uh, Notorious, uh, which was made in 46, um, is another uh, gem that uh, isn't as well known as those later four or five movies uh, that he made the mid 50s and early 60s. So, so he has stated, I mean, Hitchcock had stated this is his favorite film of all ones he made. I don't know if it was just in American films, but I've heard that before. So why do you guys think uh, he said that? Why does, did you know why he said it was his favorite? Cause I mean, he made a lot of classic films here using a lot of style and technique that I think is really good. So why do you think he thought it was favorite, Ted? Well, in the interviews, he really never says why. And in fact, in some of them, he, the Truffaut Hitchcock interviews, he kind of poo poos it as his favorite, but at any rate, it, it keeps popping up. And, and the, what, it's been surmised is that he had such a great experience making this movie. Um, he collaborated with Thornton Wilder and, and he, Thornton Wilder is not so well known today, but, but he's known for our town, um, which is a, which is a, uh, you know, a play about an average American town and, and all the things going on into it has a narrator and all this kind of thing. And so uh, apparently he, he and Hitchcock just kind of, um, hit it off. Um, they're the ones that went up to Santa Rosa together and, and found um, this house where it takes place. And there's a story about the house too, where they uh, they found the house and they thought, great, this is a little dilapidated and that's the way it should be and all that. So when the people found out that uh, it was going to be in the movie, they, they went out and had it painted 
<laughs> and all spruced up. And so, oh no, this isn't right. So the they had to go the the, the, the uh, Hollywood, um, you know, scene guys went on and they had to dress it down again. They shot the movie and then they painted it up again. So um, <laughs> that's funny. But the, it was him. It was he and uh, Wower who did that. Um, so and then the, the uh, from everything I hear, you know, the, playing in, in Santa Rosa, the, the, the other part of this film is it was done on site, which was kind of unusual uh, that early in Hollywood for them to do it um, in Santa Rosa itself. And apparently, the just had a great time in, uh, with the people there. They enjoyed him being there, and uh, the cast all said it was great. So I'm I'm thinking it might be his favorite film, partly be mostly because. It was a great experience for him, and also it also was. Um, I think he was the first time he was truly independent, um, where he could be his own man. Um, where where Selznick was always giving him brief about how things should go and all that kind of thing. So it, it was a, a, all the freedom involved was was involved in the two, and and of course, well, then we can get into the whole part of where it gets into his themes and. Um, mm -hmm. You know the the, the freedom, yeah. You know, the the the, uh, the 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 shots with the ring and and how that connects people and 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 the you know the, the likable the affable um, Uncle Charlie who's really a really sick man. I mean that's a, he's an incredibly sick um, um, person. At any rate, I'm, I'm babbling. So go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, we got we got an hour. We'll get it all in. <laughs> Kevin, how about your thoughts on that? But well, why Hitchcock I, I might have with, felt? I agree with most of, most of what Ted said. The, you know, shooting in Santa Rosa, there was a very familial um, sense with the the cast and crew um, up there. Hitchcock actually lived in Northern California, so he was able to play the affable host um, on weekends where he would host uh, dinner parties for the the cast and crew. Um, he enjoyed that, and and also sort of piggybacking on um, what Ted said uh, regarding David O. Selznick. He wasn't free of Selznick. He was on loan out to Universal Pictures. Mm -hmm. So he was free of the day-to-day -day meddling that uh, Selznick uh, put on him in the three films that, that he actually made for Selznick. Um, Rebecca, uh, what is it, Spellbound, and um, The Paradigm Case um, were the three that he actually made directly for uh, Selznick. Then Selznick loaned him out which is Selznick would collect say $100,000, give Hitchcock maybe 10 or 20,000 and pocket the rest um, so that he could make a movie at another studio. This movie, Shadow of a Doubt, was made at Universal Studios as part of a two picture deal that he did for Universal. This was the second of the two. And um, Selznick had no direct day-to-day -day influence on the film. Now he did have some sort of background influence on the film, most notably, um, bringing Joseph Cotton um, to the part of Charlie. Uh, Joseph Cotton was a uh, under contract to Selznick, as was Hitchcock. Um, but uh, I think Ted nailed it, that he was free to not be under the thumb of Selznick, who drove him nuts. And that's why I say, said in my earlier piece, um, while Rebecca won Best Picture, it's generally credited as a David O. Selznick picture and not a Hitchcock picture, because there's so much that varies from what Hitchcock truly stood for and how much uh, Selznick put his thumb uh, in the pudding uh, as they were making Rebecca um, really sort of took that away from Hitchcock. And that that's, it's my opinion, but I think it's, it's evident when you watch the film that it's, it's definitely more of a, a Selznick picture. Um, but yeah, I think that's, that's why he enjoyed Shadow of a Doubt. He did have the freedom, like, like Ted said, um, for the, for the first time. So Oh, good. So uh, this will be a you know, film, I believe, also <clears throat> will stand up with time and remain in film history. And I think all the things we've talked about and if for the viewers and they've watched the film, it's something that stays with you. You will always remember this film. I've seen it years ago on TV when I was younger, but I could remember basically what was going on, but I couldn't remember everything. But it will stand the test of time. So let's go to our very first question uh, that we had prepared for beforehand. Uh, what makes Shadow of a Doubt a film noir movie? Um, Ted, let's. You're the lead on this. Let's start with you on this one. It's not a film noir. I mean, film noir has certain characteristics. Like, um, it's usually a detective 
Um, there's usually a really bad uh, gangster kind of person that the detective or the protagonist is trying to, uh, to get, get, um, get. And then there, of course, there's the femme fatale in, in, a, in a film noir um, that, that just, just not in this film. I mean, there, there's no double cross and, and that kind of thing from a, from a dame. You know, there's no dames in this thing. Um, now, the, there you could say though. Um, well, see, Hitchcock grew up uh, was a silent filmmaker, and was and actually made some films or was involved in films in, in Germany um, during this, the silent era, where there was a lot of expressionistic stuff going on, and 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 it's a big influence on him. So in <clears throat> this film, there are shots uh, with deep shadows. Um, there's a, in the beginning, there's a scene where there's this really, um, they're trying to find, uh, Joseph Cotton in, in Newark or wherever this is in New Jersey. And there's this really high shot that, that looks just like a Fritz Long shot in, in one of his films. So, um, somewhat stylistically, it's, it's a film noir, but, but not in the story and, and not, um, there's, there's certainly no streets with rain, rain slick streets that you usually have in a film noir, that kind of thing. Um, so, um, it, but it is a dark <clears throat> movie, um, underneath it all. Um, it's, there's a lot of, uh, you know, the Joseph Cotton character is just, uh, uh, it's reprehensible. I mean, it, with that thing that you, that little speech you put on the, in the beginning, it's it, every time I see it, it just gets <laughs> chilled. I mean, you know, he's, he's turning people, all these women into animals and, and you know, his next word is they just need to be slaughtered. And it's just like, oof. and there's another, there's another uh, dialogue in there or monologue where he talks about how if you tore the front off of all of these houses, what you would see inside and all this kind of stuff. So mm -hmm. uh, that, that tone is, is filmed wrong, <clears throat> but it's a little more arty. It's a little more, um, it's not so generic as, as you would see in a, in a film noir kind of film. Oh, that's my take. All right. Thank you, Ted. Uh, Kevin, you're the film noir expert here, I think, right? Well, I love, I love film I know. noir. And what you have to, to remember about the oh. film noir movement is um, that while the Maltese Falcon is generally credited with being the beginning of the classic era of film noir, that was 1941, um, film noir was identified looking back at about uh, – eight to 10 years worth of films by French critics looking back at American films that, that flooded the market after World War II. And it was at that time that they started identifying these common um, commonality in these darker films. At the time, they were marketed as either um, uh, crime thrillers or murder mysteries, um, not as film noir, because film noir didn't, that, that idea didn't exist um, at the studios. So they were marketed uh, the, a murder mystery or crime thrillers. That, that's how they were marketed. Um, and all of the things that have been layered onto film noir, you know, the dark shadow, the uh, Duriusco, uh lighting, the, uh, the femme fatale, the, uh, the dark um, sort of foreboding uh, nature all came later. And uh, if you look behind me, I'll go this way. <laughs> uh, Double Indemnity, which was made in 1944, really is the quintessential noir and has all of the elements of noir. So what I call shadow of a doubt and noir, not in any stretch of the imagination. I think as Ted said, there's some um, elements that Hitchcock took from German expressionism um, that played a heavy part in the creation of, uh, of film noir as a movement. Um, but I don't think this, uh, this does the, the the main thing for me. If you can um, do it, because I and Ted, see if you can think of another uh, film. I was trying to think of another noir that had a female sleuth um, as young Charlie plays in this movie, and the only one I could think of was Phantom Lady, which I think was forty four or forty five. Um, but other than that, it's a pretty male protagonist dominated movement. Um, of film, yeah, so I mean, breakers, not a noir. Yeah, yeah, and I, I feel. Thank you for sharing this, guys, because uh, it's listed at IMDb as a film noir movie, and it's a yeah. thriller. And I actually see it more artistically. And but the plot is very just, you know, like you said, an average family. And this guy just says things aren't average out of nowhere, and then he's back to average. 
And it's just like, whoa. Right. So, all right. Well, thank you guys. So, uh, wait, thank Do we have a question yet from the audience that we could post? Oh, Sherry Edwards. Hi, Sherry. It's good to see you again. Uh, the question is, Joseph Cotton did a great job of being the charming villain. Do you think the truth came out after his death that he was the killer in the movie? Not Joseph Cotton, <laughs> the, but the actor, the character in the movie. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, who wants to go first here? How about Ted? Well, I don't think it matters about that. Uh, it's, it's more about um, Charlie, the young Charlie being completely disillusioned. Um, I mean, this is one of the interesting things of the film is that they're so so attached. They're sort of, like you say, they're twins. And um, it's what I find interesting and, and not totally believable, but it, it, it's implied that um, the young Charlie is so attached to the older Charlie that even when she knows the truth, um, she's really unable to um, actually make that next step. And, and he tries to murder her twice. Um, that doesn't make that next step to, um, to go and, and kill, um, you know, to, uh, to, to, to talk, go to the police about him and talk about him. I mean, I know she doesn't want to have her mother upset. That's part of it, but, but there's more to it. And it really does take the fact that she actually, um, it looks like an accident, but to a certain extent, she pushes him off the train and that's the only way she can make, break that connection. And that's that's a big part of this film is how um, totally co connected the two of them are together, and so with that broken at the end, she can she is freed uh, from it, and so it really doesn't matter about the uh, whether he's a kill. And they they make a big point of the fact that um, they don't want to break his uh, break his anonymity, sort of uh, break his uh, you know they they don't want to discourage uh, you know the people that thought he was a great guy, so. That's. I don't think it matters. It really doesn't matter. It's not. It's not an issue for Hitchcock in making the film that he gets caught. Mm -hmm. Kevin. Well, uh, here's. <laughs> so we haven't talked about them yet, but perhaps we will um, as we move through this month of Hitchcock. But it's always there's the MacGuffin, right? The mm -hmm. the irrelevant plot point that drives the plot, but at the end of the day, really has no. Um, bearing on the story. And I think the him per perhaps, and, and this could be argued because sometimes uh, the MacGuffins aren't as crystal clear as you think they would be. Um, but he, Charlie, Uncle Charlie being the um, Mary Widow murder um, is somewhat the MacGuffin in this film because at the end of the day, it really, you know, the police have found somebody else to convict or not to convict, but because he was killed, um, assume is the guilty party. So it, Uncle Charlie then is free of that, except for the ring, right, which is the only the proof. But at the end of the day, that's not going to get him convicted. It, being the Mary Widow murder is irrelevant. So I would argue that it's ultimately the, the MacGuffin of uh, Shadow of a Doubt. So it's not important. It does, it, 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 I shouldn't say it's not important. Hitchcock doesn't care if he's found to be the murderer or not. It's for Hitchcock, it's irrelevant. And at that last scene where um, young Charlie's with the detective that says he loves her all of a sudden, um, and so they're together. And you could actually that was I thought that was a good piece of acting by young Charlie because she was still dealing with all that and had to say things and tell the detective all the things she couldn't say before. But the detectives and everybody couldn't do anything as long as he's dead. We're all good, you know, and no more Mary Widows happen. So well, let, let's let's it's talk for a second. Go ahead. I was just saying, let's talk for a second about young Charlie, and that's uh, Teresa Wright. Right. And what a phenomenal actress she was. This was her fourth, uh, and I think Ted said this in in the introduction. This was her fourth film role, and in her first three, she she was nominated for an Academy Award. So think about that. I mean. In the classic studio era, young actress, she's in her early 20s. She was born in 1918, so she would have been, what, uh, 24, uh, 23, 24 when Shadow of Doubt came out. And she'd already been nominated for three Academy Awards, winning one for Best Supporting Actress and uh, Mrs. Miniver. So 
her performance in this film is really the glue that that holds it together that makes it believable makes it terrifying because we're we're seeing a lot of this through her eyes we look at uncle charlie through her eyes once she discovers who he is and i think that you know the the love story piece was what british critics did not like about this movie because they thought hitchcock had gone all hollywood on him by um adding the romance with the the police officer and the detective um in the story but Teresa Wright, i just i can't say enough about what a great performance charlie you know young charlie is uh in this film so i just i i have to rave about Teresa Wright for just a minute <laughs> yeah i mean she really does a great job of the, of portraying the conflict she feels yeah. i mean and and that's the thing about joseph cotton and his role is that he is even though you know how what an awful person he is, he's still a very attractive person. I mean, <laughs> you know, he's very debonair, and you know he, he's really a rascal, though. I mean, not more than a rascal, but I mean, when he goes in the bank and he torments the the the, the father, I mean, um, yeah. some of the family members just can't stand him. Uh, the little, the girl with the glasses, <laughs> what I forget her name, what Anne, and yeah, she she she's suspicious of him. Uh, you know, you tore up the newspaper and all that stuff, and the father just doesn't get it. But the, but the mother is just totally enraptured by him, and um, they don't want to just they don't want to break her heart about knowing what her uh, beloved brother's about. I mean, there's that a little. Uh, we can talk about this too. There's that little bit about how Charlie, Uncle Charlie, the older Charlie, had a bicycle accident or something, and and hit his head um and that's a and that kind of changed his personality something like that and that's the only hint in there of, of where his deviant behavior might have come from and it, and it seems like they may have had this idyllic childhood but it seems like it broke up at some point because he was out on his own when he was 16 he said and there's these just these little things that are dropped in there and they're never tied together and there, there's, uh, fortunately, there's no psychiatrist like in Psycho that tries to explain the whole thing. <laughs> right. But um, it, it, it's just tantalizing, um, you know, of, of what, where Charlie came from and, and, and what the family background was for him and uh, why the, and I, I, there's just no explanation, but the, the mother adores him, you know, the, the, sister, the sister. Well, and then... <laughs> Larry, as, as Ted was talking and, and I was talking before, and you're showing a couple of these pictures of young Charlie with Uncle Charlie, the, yeah. the images, if you're just taken as a still frame, they look like lovers. Yes. You know, and I know Hitchcock sort of has sometimes this undercurrent of um, sexuality that he drops in. You can argue that in some places it's inappropriate sexuality or sort of not deviant sexuality, but off the beaten path. And I think the, 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 the most telling of those is the scene when he gives her the ring. And the, the still image of that, the, the scene of that, looks like it's a proposal as she you know, puts her hand out and he puts the ring on it. But, but I think that's, yeah, there you go. So this, the, that's the, the, the picture right there. That's a proposal image right there between those two. And they, they have this odd relationship and i know it, you know it's obviously just layering on what we want to see um uh not what you know what's actually happening in the relationship i wouldn't want to suggest that there was incest happening or anything like that between these two but it is more than just a uncle niece relationship and i think that 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 adds another undercurrent um to both Wright's performance because she loves this man she adores this man she looks up to this man and he is her twin. And to, like what Ted said, when he's dead, you know, as they often say about twins, you lose a piece of yourself when your twin dies. So I think that it's it just adds another layer to, to Wright's performance. Um, and I think it's, uh, again, very interesting. <laughs> and, and Joseph Cotton, in acting through the scene himself, he changes from this, I really, here's the ring and everything else. And as soon as she says, oh, and she's all giddy and everything, and looking inside, look, oh, look, at there's some writing inside here. And he just turns as you see the look on his face. 
-hmm. and it turns and then he tries to recover from it. He does. There was another shot I showed earlier where he actually is, you know, finishing up the conversation with her and he just manipulates her all the way through that. That is just like, whoa, the acting between the two of them and the filming of that was just really good. And then there's this place where she um, is quite innocently saying, well, I really know the real you and the, I can know I can tell your secrets and this expression that Cotton has on his face just for an instant it just f- flashes over his face it's just like oh my ah it's caught <laughs> yeah but another thing about the cotton the, the the type of crazy that Cotton is it's sort of he's sort of a uh, sociopath and 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 sociopaths have a way or um that in that realm of of of, of pathology have a way of drawing people in and making people like you even though you don't know who that person is and so um there's this widow that keeps popping up in the movie three or four places and right. she's completely taken by him and he hasn't done anything he's just given her a smile and um that it's part of his pathology is that he's able to be very attractive and have people really come towards him even though He's uh, they people don't know him, and they really don't know how, what an evil person he is, you know. And I think, and I think that's another reason why the movie has, has stayed. Um, I don't th- in back in '42, I don't think people were accustomed to that kind of um, uh, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? A horror, uh, murder. Yeah, murder. I mean, sort of the suave murderer. Um, and then, and again, Joe Cotton. Up until this time, you could. Correct me, Kevin. He never played a, a negative role like this. I mean, I know he did a little later. He did um, in, uh, Niagara. That's a, he's a murderer in there. But usually he's just sort of this soft-spoken um, sidekick kind of guy with Orson Welles, you know, or in that Magnificent Amersons, he's a, you know, a, a, a man who uh, is resi- resigned to his fate as uh, not having <laughs> his wife that he wanted and all that kind of thing. Well, when when uh, when Hitchcock offered him the, uh, the role before they went filming, uh, he, um, Hitch and Cotton went to lunch at the Brown Derby, of course, because in 1941, 42, that's where you went to eat lunch in Los Angeles. Um, and and Cotton quizzed um, Hitchcock about how he should play this role, how um, you know how to approach it. And Hitchcock said, "Let's go for a walk." So they walked um, down the, the, the street. And Hitchcock said, I want you to pick out somebody who you think is a murderer. And they walked a little while. And yeah, Cotton pointed to uh, a gentleman who was uh, standing on the sidewalk. And I said, him right there, look at his shifty eyes. And Hitchcock said, no, Joseph, those aren't shifty eyes. Those are eyes that are shifting. Look to his left. And they looked and there was a woman getting out of a car with long legs and her nylons extended um, as she stepped to the curb. And Hitchcock said, that's not a shifty guy. He's just looking at something he enjoys. And Cotton said, okay, well then, you know, how do you play a killer? And Hitchcock said, that's just it. You don't know a killer unless you know him. If you, you you can't see a killer um, just anywhere. They look just like you and I. And I think that's how Cotton largely plays this role is yes he's a psychopath and psychopaths are devious and dangerous but i think he plays a psychopath wonderfully because he is an ordinary guy um who you know just alights on this family and and you know brings mayhem and darkness with him but it goes to ted to your point that that speech that he gives to to young charlie about peeling the the front off a house and and seeing what's behind it and you would see um you know danger and murder and abuse and everything else um but here as hitchcock does throughout most of his films there's a grayness in evil because he never paints people as purely good or evil there's a grayness of either direction for all of us and i think that's how hitchcock wants us to see Uncle Charlie, is there's a grayness in there. These people love him, but he's still a, a sociopath, a psychopath. So, yeah, and and it, apparently he's not doing it for the money. I mean, I think the money he um, he uses he's on the table. 
you know? Yeah. And, you know, he, he gave money as a, to the junior league or whatever. I forget who he gave it to some yeah. fund or something like that. So it, it's pretty unclear why he, except that he's just hate. He, he, he we, don't want to, we don't want to think that's possible to think that way. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I mean, I, I think the, 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 yeah. the sociopath would believe that they're doing it for the good of the person, right? Because once someone gets or an animal gets too fat, they slaughter it, right? That's what he, he says in that speech. And I think that he does, you know, any good sociopath would rationalize their actions to be completely acceptable. Which and is what he does. So, okay. So we can, so he, we've declared he is a social psychopath, <laughs> yeah. and we can't figure out why. Uh, and I think that's clear with all sorts of psychopaths. But let's go on. If we have another question from the audience, there, uh, White Fang. Hi, Rita. Good to see you again. Uh, the film was made in 1941 to 42, released in 1943. Why is there no mention of World War II in the film? I just, just, I, I, my understanding about World War II is that um, it really didn't come to the home front for a while of what was really going on in the war. Um, apparently, there were some photographs of Guadalcanal um, that really like uh, rang the bell for people in the United States. So uh, I think at this time, so early in the war, people weren't so. Um, aware of, of the, the brutality and the awfulness going on. I, that's just, and, and again, it's in this small town. Um, I, that's the only reason I can, and it just, it was probably created, the ideas just started before the war effort happened. I'm, I, I really couldn't answer that question more than that. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I think that's it, 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 exactly when they um, went into production it was pre-war. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, Thornton Wilder was uh, only able to spend five weeks writing the script, the first draft of the first rough draft of the script, um, because uh, he needed money for his family, his mother and his wife, and I think he had a daughter at the time. Um, so he asked for fifteen thousand dollars, but he had five weeks until he reported for military service, um, and so it was pre-war, like I said, but. Uh, uh, they there was elements of the war that that impacted the uh, the filming, but I don't think it would, it just it didn't bear itself out in the in the script. And this, and this film wasn't well reviewed or well received, meaning that it didn't get a lot of play. The war itself might have had some impact on that. I think the viewership and everything else. Yeah. So, uh, but being in there, I remember there was at the tavern. There were some soldiers there. Uh, we saw the war bond sign across the the teller window by war bonds. But uh, it, I think it's right to say is that early on when this was filmed in 41 and in 42, early 42, <clears throat> there wasn't that big of an impact yet on the people uh, um, until later into 43 when this movie was actually released. Well, so, one of the reasons why they ended, they ended up shooting in Santa Rosa was because that the government had a um, a you could only spend $5,000 on new set construction for any film. Um, so instead of building all the sets and a, a studio, which would have cost more money, that's why they, they went up and filmed on location and then went back and made just the house uh, where the family lives on a, a studio soundstage to shoot some of the interiors. And they spent all of $1,975 building that house um, on the universal lot. So, so it did impact in some subtle ways, but not anything overt, um, mm -hmm. that comes through in the script. Certainly. Certainly. Okay. All right. Well, I think, do we have another question for, for our panelists here? Were the discussions about killing each other between Joseph and Herman comic relief? Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, but that's Hitchcock humor. It's I mean, Hitchcock humor. He loves, um, as we all know, in the Hitchcock, um, you know, presents it, it, it was that kind of that kind of humor. But um, uh, all through the movie and in, in the uh, the dialogue, there's all these little hints to that. Like, you know, if, if we told your 
told your mother about Uncle Charlie, it would kill her, you know. And and I I, I I haven't gone through all the little bits and pieces, but there are, you know, I would die for that, or or things. I think they're little things like that through. But I mean, um, I don't know. It's just a, a comic relief, but it's a Hitchcock kind of thing, and and that's the kind of thing he what was. There was a magazine he did too, right? Of of mm -hmm. uh, of, of, of these kinds of stories. So um, he was kind of tuned into that. And um, the, the, the Hume Cronin character is pretty interesting. I mean, there's this guy who lives with his mother and um, just kind of um, shows up, you know, he's a, he's a, the, the, film, the film is filled with, not filled, but there's like five or six really neat little characters, like the little girl um, who, you know, it's in a book, so it, it has to be true. <laughs> <laughs> and, oh, that kind of stuff. <laughs> and uh, always reading books. And uh, um, the Hume Cronin, apparently he was very young. This is his first film. Is that right, Kevin? Yeah. yeah. And yeah, so he yeah. wasn't sure whether he would get the role because he was so young. <laughs> but uh, Hitchcock said, put on the glasses and we'll, we'll put some gray hair on you. And there you go. Right. So, yeah, it's, it's funny because uh, Hume Cronin and Hitchcock became lifelong friends. And um, Hume Cronin actually did two adaptations um, that uh, Hitchcock turned from plays into films with Rope and um, uh, Under Capricorn. Um, Cronin actually did the screenplays for both those. So they were lifelong friends. And this started it um, with his appearance here, um, like I said, his first, uh, his first screen role. So mm -hmm. it wasn't just Cocoon for oh. Hume Cronin. <laughs> Um, All right. But I mean, it's typical of Hitchcock and it goes back to that whole thing of nothing is black and white. Yes. Uh, yeah. You know, the, the, you know, there's all that humor that's mixed into these things mm -hmm. and, um, you know, and everybody tolerates it. So, you know, so, so even, you know, that that's just these two guys having, I mean, I love the thing with the mushroom. <laughs> I, I can well, one mushroom in your soup and you'd be gone. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, and Hitchcock was a huge fan of like sensational murder stories and would follow the trials, um, especially when he lived in London. He would follow the trials um, as they wound their way through the courts. And he was a big fan of, of you know, looking back at you know, mass murders and, and sensational murder cases. So I think that it's sort of a, you know, because he and Wilder did, do a lot of the, the initial writing on, on the draft that uh, that Wilder did together. They would uh, work in the, they would have discussions all morning about different uh, plot points and scenes and things um, each morning. Um, and as was uh, Hitchcock's normal uh, uh, his normal plan, he would then have a, a nice big lunch and then take a nap in the afternoon. Well, that's when Wilder would actually go back and and write the scenes that they would then review the next day. Um, so uh, they did collaborate a lot. So I think that those two, those, that discussion is, is definitely, that reflects Hitchcock through and through um, in everything that he finds funny and macabre mm -hmm. for sure. Uh, and it also kind of reminds me too, is that I saw the crime novels and the way they're talking about it is the way today talk, people talk about science fiction or some of the other things like we were talking about Mandalorian beforehand uh, they wanted to follow these things, what's going on with it. And that to them, that was always stories, I think. Uh, White Fang, do we have another question out there? Thornton Wilde was listed as a screenwriter. How much did he participate? Why was he involved? I mean, we've covered some of this, but uh, how much did he participate then? Of long, you know, how much was his? Uh, more of us than I. We, we, we did cover most of it, I think. I'm not sure how they got to know each other. Maybe you know, Kevin. Well, it, it, it goes back to the connection of, uh, of our town. Um, Hitchcock made a point whenever he was in London or New York to always go see as many plays as he could. And he saw Our Town, um, which ironically starred uh, Teresa Wright as Emily. And then um, young Charlie's mother was also in the original Broadway production of Our wow. Town. So there's this thread of, of Thornton Wilder running, running through this. Um, and Hitchcock wanted somebody to... Um, who knew small town America. So he approached Wilder um, after enjoying our town so much. Um, the original story was from a novelist. Um, I can't think of his name. Off the top of my, oh, Gordon McDonald, who actually won an Oscar nomination for best original story for this. 
he gave Hitchcock a six po- six page treatment uh, for the script, um, but was writing a novel at the time and didn't want to spend any more time on the story. So that's where Hitchcock um, worked with his wife, Alma Ravel, who um, was essentially ghosted um, a lot of Hitchcock's um, scripts and, and certainly edited edited them. So she, you know, they sort of, he, uh, Hitch and her sort of worked things out, the story added more um, characters and things. Then he passed it on to Wilder and they built in the five weeks, the first rough draft. Um, and to Wilder's credit, um, he accepted um, Hitchcock saying after their first draft was completed, which they completed on the train ride from Los Angeles to the East Coast, uh, where uh, Wilder was going to, uh, to enlist, um, that he needed someone to polish it up. Those were the spending it so, a week on the train, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. So, so there's actually six different writers who touched this at, at various points. And I think the reason why Thornton Wilder gets that special mention at the beginning is because Hitchcock kind of felt bad that this great man of American letters was subjected to the, the Hollywood treatment of writers in general, which is take a Fitzgerald, take a Hemingway, take a Faulkner um, and let, you know, give them their genius, but then tweak it with some Hollywood hack um, before it gets to screen. And I think that's why Hitchcock felt bad, put that, um, put that, that special message, which is very odd. I mean, you mm-hmm. never see that um, at the front of a movie um, like that. Um, so Wilder was very engaged. Um, but like I said, he was one of six writers who, who did this. He did, I, I would say, if there was an original, if there was a screenplay um, award for this, then his name would have been on top. But there's five other folks that touched it. Mm-hmm. So. There's, a, there's another thing about Wilder is that he was sort of a classy um, man of ladders and Hitchcock um, felt he deserved to be among that crowd. And because, like I was saying, he was seen as a man of suspense who made these clever little um, suspense movies and all that kind of thing. Uh, he wasn't tre- given the, the, the due he would he, he deserved, he felt. And so when Wilder came along, that was... Uh, it, 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 he, he was feeling he was uh, being uh, elevated to be an equal um, and he yeah. certainly deserved it, that's for sure. Yeah. I, I want to jump in here because um, we're running a little near the end. A big part of um, the, the, what the critics have looked in this movie are the doubles mm-hmm. um, throughout the whole film. Um, the main thing is, of course, Charlie and Uncle Charlie as they're seen as twins and that kind of thing. But, but throughout the movie, there's all kinds of other doubles that is going on um, and have been pointed out. I, I happen to think that one of the most important ones is that there's a front staircase and a back staircase. Um, and I, I, it, Hitchcock has staircases all over the place in his movies. All, all, they're, they're very important. But this one means much more than in a lot of the films. And I think it adds a lot to it because um, there's sort of the front public staircase where everybody comes down and when you walk in the door, you see it and that kind of thing. But then there's the back staircase. Um, Charlie, both Charlies use it to get away from, uh, get away with something, um, to have a secret. And, And in fact, um, at the end, uh, so, you know, one of the murder things is um, one of the murder attempts is done on that stair. So the back right. stair becomes a um, a dangerous place, a, 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 a fatal, almost a fatal place, and 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 that's the kind of thing that Hitchcock does, and it's just not obvious. It's not telegraphed, but it's essential to the way he um, makes his film. It's cinema. That's what cinema is: is is having these. Um, situations or these these uh, things that seem normal enough, but um, add so much in, uh, to them. Uh, people have gone so far as to say that there's a place where Joseph Cotton uh, dials in the telephone um, to make this telegram, and the number he goes to is two. <laughs> there's a two there. There are two detectives. Um, there are two scenes by the church. There are two. There are two scenes in the in the in the dining. There are two uh, dining room scenes. 
There's always uh, there's the two girls that are friends of uh, young Charlie. There's always so, two there's two siblings. On that, and, and I don't know how much of it is uh, is uh, uh, on purpose, but some of it is. But mm -hmm. I, I don't know about every little detail of these kind of. Oh, the the, the club they go to is called the Till Two. Two. Yeah. <laughs> No, no, Ted. I thought in your introduction, I thought you did a great job of. But I think stairs. What's that? I, I think in your introduction, I really liked that with the stairs because I think that's the whether all of these are planned or not. I think that's one that that Hitchcock definitely put in there to have meaning that that echoes out through through the film of the the front facing facade and the deeper darker back behind the facade, right? The back stairway. And that's where the murder attempt is made. Um, but you see the light in the, in the front stairs. And I, I really like, I thought that was well said in the in, in introduction that you did. All right. So do we have another question there, White Fang? <clears throat> Anne and Roger appear as very inquisitive children. What was their role in the film? <laughs> um, Kevin, do you laugh first, so do you want well, to go first on this? Well, in the original six-page treatment, um, young Charlie has an older brother who's a year older than uh, her. Um, when Wilder and Hitchcock started working on it, they immediately pulled that brother um, out of the, the script and added these two younger children for exactly that reason, sort of this, you know, I mean, Hitchcock always liked a young girl in glasses in his films. In, in later years, he gave that part to his daughter, Patricia, in a string of films, um, most famously in Strangers on a Train, um, but certainly in other films uh, that she appeared in, in the, as the bespeckled, uh, inquisitive, kind of nerdy, but um, uh, always troubling, troublesome uh, teenager. So I think they added that as a precursor to what he would do later with Patricia. And uh, they say odd things, they say interesting things, um, but they always serve sort of a lighter motif for, for Hitchcock. Yeah, the, the other, what's interesting too is apparently this, the, the, the girl actress, the little young girl was discovered when they were up in Santa Rosa checking things out, right, right. Uh, they, they somehow uh, Hitchcock said, hey, you're, you're the one. And, uh, <laughs> Had her go down to Hollywood and read through it, and she had no experience at all um, at being an actress or anything. Apparently, she was in a couple other films, but that wasn't her main thing. But it was just Hitchcock took a liking to her, and she's great. I mean, I love her, her lines. She's just, yeah. <laughs> and she's so you know the the other thing about these, these speckled girl is these just speckled girls is they they're they're no self conscious. I mean, they're just. This is they just present themselves as this is the way we are and take it or leave it, you know. They they don't right. care what impression you make, you know. Uh -uh. Yeah. All right. Any other another question? Uh White Fang. How did this creepy per creepy portrayal of Uncle Charlie affect Joseph Cotton's career? Kevin? Yeah, I, I don't think it had any impact on his career. I, I mean, like Ted said earlier, I mean, up until this point, uh, Cotton had been only been known mainly for working with Orson Welles. Um, and I think, uh, you know, in Citizen Kane and Magnificent Ambersons. Um, but he, uh, Cotton went on to have a, a great career. I mean, even another film with Welles that uh, Welles didn't direct, but The Third Man is one of the greatest films of the 40s. Uh, I think that was 1949. Um, uh, so he, he had a great career. He did, uh, um, a lot of television in the fifties as, as most actors did. Um, he even did a part in, uh, Petulia in 1968, swinging London. So he was hip, although he wasn't really hip in Petulia, but the movie's hip anyway. Um, but he had a long career, long, great career. I think and Ted nailed it earlier. He was the quintessential sort of every man. Uh, just a normally a good guy, and and he um, he always played himself. I mean, he, he was Joseph Cotton, um, <laughs> right. but there's a, a, a variation to it, of course. And yeah. He, he when somebody asked how how it was to be an actor, he said, "I just I, I just did it." 
<laughs> right. It was a big deal to him. He, he grew up in a uh, genteel, genteel Southern family in uh, in Richmond, and then he already sort of played that that kind of role. Um, so, yeah. and, and I was as researching this film a little bit more, I found a movie I had seen before, and I didn't remember it that well. But I, after seeing it, it's called I think it's called It's Good Seeing You Again. I'll see I see uh, I will see you again, or I'll see you then. And it's about, it's got uh, Joseph Cotton, Ginger Rogers, and Shirley Temple. And it has similar elements of this movie, but uh, Joseph Cotton plays a convalescent uh, soldier during the war. And Ginger Rogers actually plays somebody who's incarcerated and gets to go home for the holidays, and they meet up. And Shirley Temple just happens to be the girl with the glasses. So, you know, <laughs> and it's uh, their teenager. And it's actually... Uh, pretty good film. I mean, I remember seeing it years ago, and uh, it's uh, I can't I can't even remember the name now. But uh, I was going to bring it up to you guys about it. But Joseph Cotton still had a really good track record and continued to do very solid roles. I think that was very good. All you right, know, we have a couple of weeks ago we had Gene Author as a, as a, as the main actress, and we talked about how she uh, yeah. just didn't really care about Hollywood and kind of like drifted away from it. And Teresa Wright was the same kind of had the same kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, she didn't want to be a starlet. I, I, I should have. There's this great thing that was in her contract about how she, apparently she couldn't um, be in a bathing suit or have uh, men dripped on, around her or something like that. Um, and she just, uh, I, I don't know. She did a whole lot after in movies so much. I think she became. In, when she was older in her, you know, in her sixties and seventies, she became kind of a ground dumb kind of character. But for many years there, I don't think she, uh, she really was that interested in being in films. And I, I guess there was some, some, uh, some stage acting she did, but um, yeah. she was another one of these people that was a very talented person, <laughs> but just did not want to get into the Hollywood scene, you know? Well, we have time. We're getting close to the end. We have time for one last question, White Fangs. So the last question we have is, where did Hitchcock appear in this film? That's you, Ted. Okay, well, he's, the, 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 when Joseph Cotton... Oh, let me just say one thing about the train. This is this, he was, Hitchcock's on the train. But there's this great thing where the train pulls into Santa Rosa. There's this black smoke coming out of the... Out of the uh, the uh, the the train, and that that was uh, you know the devil comes to town, you know. And apparently Hitchcock said he, it was a lot of trouble to make that black smoke come out, but uh, that was one of his uh, one of his touches. But at any rate, um, as they're coming into the station, Hitchcock is sitting with his back; you can barely see him. Uh, he's, he's in his back uh, playing cards with uh, with uh, some friends or somebody. And then there's a, a cut into his hand, the hand of the cards that he has. And there's all spades. So what's that's the best bridge hand or something like that? I'm not, I'm not a bridge fan, but um, yeah. I, I thought I had the picture of that. And I don't. I had one and I didn't put it into the show. Sorry, guys. But that's that's where he's found. And you don't see his face. But the doctor goes to him and are you looking OK? And, and they then they pan in on the whole all the spades. And this is around the time when. He said, I've got to get myself in the beginning of the film. Otherwise, people are going to be distracted looking for me. So this right, is right. In the first 15 minutes or so. <clears throat> Any other comments on that, uh, Kevin? I, no. No. My favorite no. talk appearance is in Lifeboat, where they, they have this newspaper. And oh, yeah, uh, yeah. It, you showed the picture <laughs> here. He had this huge, he was huge in, when he was making Shadow of a Doubt. Yeah. But in in Lifeboat, they took a picture of a diet supplement, and the before and after picture is Hitchcock is the before and the after in this advertisement. <laughs> and apparently, he did lose a lot of weight after this movie. Yeah, he was huge. I saw that pic the only picture I could I found of him and that set, and he was just like huge. The one we had earlier. So, I mean, he's, yes. very, he's popping out of his clothes here. Yeah, he, looks, right. he loved oh, to eat. They say. All right. Well, thank you, guys. I want to thank you very much for being here today and helping us out. I want to thank everybody who's been here. And just to let you know that we have more Hitchcock available for you. Uh, this month is all Hitchcock. Uh, it's salute to Hitchcock. We started with The Shadow of a Doubt this last weekend. We're doing The Birds this next weekend. And then the weekend after that, we're doing Rear Window. And we will be doing from Rear Window then 
We will actually be following up with a Beyond the Bay Live. And on Thanksgiving weekend, we'll be doing Psycho. All right. <laughs> but we'll be back again in two weeks to do a live stream of Rear Window. You can catch it at the Bay or catch it on your streaming service. We'll be back here again at 7.30 p.m. on Tuesday, November 24th, and to discuss the movie Rear Window. So we want to thank you to all those who came today and uh, participated, giving us your questions and your time. And we appreciate very much you coming here. And remember, you can always subscribe to our um, uh, YouTube channel. You can subscribe to the YouTube channel somewhere down below in, in this feed. And you will get the updates when we post introductions or movies or anything actually we're doing for the Live Beyond the Bay. If you want to stay in touch with the uh, theater, uh, go to our website, thebaytheater.com, and you will see a place to log in and be able to get a uh, enter your email address to get our mailing list. We want to say thank you very much, and we'll see you again in two weeks uh, with Rear Window. So enjoy, have yourself, and stay safe. Thank you all.